Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Hope you are fine. Today we are going to go through the practical implications of this program, Comedy of Manners. I mean, why it is important, how it is relevant to the practical, uh, theoretical stuff, or is it mere fiction? The comedy of manners is an entertainment form which satirizes the manners and affectations of a social class or of multiple classes, often represented by stereotypical stock characters. For example, the Miles Gloriosus, boastful soldier in ancient times, the fop and the rake during the English Restoration, or an old person pretending to be young. Restoration comedy is used as a synonym for comedy of manners. The plot of the comedy, often concerned with scandal, is generally less important than its witty dialogue. A great writer of comedies of manners was Oscar Wilde, his most famous play being The Importance of Being Earnest. The comedy of manners was first developed in the new comedy of the ancient Greek playwright Menander. His style, elaborate plots, and stock characters were imitated by the Roman playwrights Plautus and Terence whose comedies were widely known and copied during the Renaissance. The best-known comedies of manners, however, may well be those of the French playwright Molière, who satirized the hypocrisy and pretension of the Ancien Regime in such plays as L.A. Call Defums, The School for Wives, 1662, Le Misanthrope, The Misanthrope, 1666, and most famously Tartuffe, 1664. The comedy of manners has been employed by Roman satirists since as early as the 1st century BC. Horace's satire 1.9 is a prominent example, in which the persona is unable to express his wish for his companion to leave, but instead subtly implies so through wit. William Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing might be considered the first comedy of manners in England, but the genre really flourished during the Restoration period. Restoration comedy which was influenced by Ben Jonson's comedy of humors, made fun of affected wit and acquired follies of the time. The masterpieces of the genre were the plays of William White Shirley, The Country Wife, 1675, and William Congreve, The Way of the World, 1700. In the late 18th century Oliver Goldsmith, She Stoops to Conquer, 1773, and Richard Brinsley Sheridan, The Rivals, 1775. The School for Scandal, 1777, revived the form. The tradition of elaborate, artificial plotting and epigrammatic dialogue was carried on by the Irish playwright Oscar Wilde in Lady Windermere's Fan, 1892, and The Importance of Being Earnest, 1895. In the 20th century, the comedy of manners reappeared in the plays of the British dramatist Snow Elk Coward, Hay Fever. 1925, and Somerset Maugham, and the novels of P.G. Wodehouse, as well as various British sitcoms. The carry-on films are a direct descendant of the comedy of manners style. The term comedy of menace, which British drama critic Irving Wardle based on the subtitle of The Lunatic View, a comedy of menace, 1958, by David Campton, is a jocular play on words derived from the comedy of manners, menace being manners pronounced with a somewhat Judeo-English accent. Pinder's play The Homecoming has been described as a mid-20th century comedy of manners. In Boston Marriage, 1999, David Mamet chronicles a sexual relationship between two women, one of whom has her eye on yet another young woman who never appears, but who is the target of a seduction scheme. Periodically, the two women make their serving woman the butt of haughty jokes, serving to point up the satire on class. Though displaying the verbal dexterity one associates with both the playwright and the genre, the patina of wit occasionally erupts into shocking crudity. Other contemporary examples include Douglas Carter Beans as Bees in Honey Drown, The Country Club, The Little Dog Laughed, and The Jeeves and Wooster series by P.G. Wadhouse. 
The television program Absolutely Fabulous is another contemporary example of the comedy of manners. Well, that takes us to our next question. Why we are studying drama? What is the purpose or aim or ambition of studying this course which you are studying at present? I mean, what is the practical significance of studying comedy of manners? Where you are going to apply it in practical world? Are we really wasting our time by studying it, by going through old stories, old drama, right? All, all, uh, old drama, all dramas or old playwrights or are we studying it for fun only for entertainment purpose only uh, mm, there could be another possibility that probably we want to enjoy art for art's sake and that is why we are taking player but we need to dig deeper we need to rethink about the issue in fact, it is not so. If we look uh, at at, uh, at at Greeks and Romans, even in those days, the purpose of play was more than entertainment and fun. People used to, rather people were forced to watch those tragedies and comedies and satires uh, for certain purpose, for certain religious or moral purpose. So there was certain aim. Later um, in, during mid 15th century, 14th, 15th, 16th century, when everything was evolved, even then plays had a didactic purpose. We cannot take away simply morality away or the didactic purpose away from plays. You know, this is something which teaches us a lot. It is not all about player. This is all about grooming us. This is all about making us a better human being. When we study play, when we study a drama, in fact, in a, this is my personal opinion, eh? this is how I look at it, that in a way at times, uh, not only we are having an exposure of different characters who lived at different eras and time slots, but also in certain ways through these characters we are tracing the process of evolution in human beings for example in Hedda Gabler, you have come across a woman who had a potential more than like she had a potential which she wanted to express creatively but she couldn't she was restricted and chained by society well when we look a uh, woman of a similar energy in contemporary times, we might find her more expressive, more creative, more innovative, and uh, someone in an in a in a way having resources to utilize her energy in a positive way. She might not need to bring out her energy or utilize her energy in destructive manner. So that is how we trace the evolution of characters. There was a time when slaves, they were not allowed even to say a word. Uh, rather, when we encounter the slave in Oedipal, uh, Oedipal Rex, Oedipus Rex in um, Sophocles time, uh, we, uh, somebody, the slave who is bringing Tresius to the stage, we come across a very different kind of servants uh, in in uh, importance of being earnest. Over there, servants are having voices, they are debating, they are interfering, they are giving opinions. And note, there is a great deal of shift from slave to servants, from one era to another era. So, in a way, these plays, these dramas, gives us a glimpse of uh, history, glimpse of past. So they teaches us something historically too. Secondly, 
morally, uh, psychologically. At times, uh, we come up with the situations when we are able to learn from them a lot too. So just let us look at another slide. G. Well, this is a definition of drama. Uh, I have came across on a website and I have linked the reference to studying drama requires emotional maturity. It gives peoples, by peoples we mean students, a deep understanding of themselves. Yes, exactly. We know about ourselves too. We learn about ourselves too. We learn about our tendencies. You know, why we need, okay, the question was, why there is a need to study drama? Are we wasting time by studying drama? As people say, they're just playing, they're just having fun, they're just entertaining themselves. But when we study it, no, it is something way different and deeper than that. It has a purpose. It requires a certain kind of emotional maturity. We cannot be, uh, we cannot, we cannot bear or we cannot dare or we cannot sustain with that kind of emotional immaturity where we just switch it off, we, where we just negate it, where it negates its importance. Drama gives people a deep understanding of themselves. When we are acting out, enacting certain characters, it helps us to understand ourselves. Aristotle once said, and I quote, know thyself, unquote. In Quran, it is said, whose meaning is that somebody who have a, somebody who comes to know about himself, he in a way has come to certain understanding of his Lord or her Lord. So if we understand or if we learn something about ourselves, it is also about uh, it is not only about learning about the creation, but also about uh, understanding creator and the greater scheme of things. It involves uh, not only using our voices, our bodies, but also our emotions and creativity. We put our something to a certain piece when we create, when we produce, it is able to engender a deep self or self-esteem. Creativity, you know, my dears, it gives us power. Trust me, no matter how sad you are, no matter how uh, depressed you are, or no matter how in blues you are, by in blues I mean that uh, somebody who is distressed, stressed out and sad, very sad. If you are able to channelize your emotions into certain kind of creativity, you get your self-esteem back. It is also a subject that requires a great deal of peer trust. By peer trust, I mean uh, peer are friends. So the ones with whom you are sharing your ideas, you need a certain kind of understanding with that. Think of someone who doesn't understand you, who doesn't empathize with you, or sympathize with you. So that person is, if that person is giving you constantly negative rebuttals, you will be more depressed. So it allows us a certain type of catharsis. Also, we switch on roles. At times, I'm servant. At times, I'm masters. And when we take on and off different roles, we start understanding these humans better. It plays an important role in teaching communication. We learn to communicate. We mimic uh, their words, their accent. And by mimicking them in a way, we own them. We acknowledge them. It uh, plays an important role in teaching, listening, and empathy skills. Some of us 
who who learn to play and produce and enact even those children when they when their energies are channelized into uh, into producing a drama even they find certain ground it is very you know the study is very demanding these the skills that we learn through studying drama are invaluable never underestimate their value you know uh, the first and primary benefit that you will have is that you will be able to give your interviews better you will be able to deliver bet good or better in an interview you will be able to perform good or at uh, what we call it oratory wise and sometimes the skills the skill of studying drama helps us to plan out which is later required in production and other useful careers now let me just share an incident with you i have a reputation of sharing and narrating a lot oh it, it and bringing a lot of narration to my lectures now there is an experiment that i have done i have carried out and to share it in a while probably in the next slide okay just let's see it let's how to write a drama script effectively now i'm going to give you some personal tactics and tips being senior to you in this line i hope some of you would be writing at in a certain level you might be content writers you might be blog writers and if nothing else hopefully you are all sms and tweet writers one way or the other we are into writing especially in this world which demands us to communicate digitally and connect with the broader world through um, uh, through internet
Oji. I hope you would be acquainted with all these terms, TikTok like Instagram, Vlogs, YouTube, generating videos through different apps, quick app or different apps which are available at Play Store. You know, we are living in digital world. We are living in a world where we can we can uh, generate content and if we are generating our content effectively we can get across our message very effectively we can not only uh, after studying the after studying drama we cannot only incorporate our learning and grooming into becoming an effective creative artist but also we can uh, we can open our way to earn by staying at home. You know, this is quarantine time. I do. I just hope when my presentation finds you, uh, it is no longer a quarantine time. It is a better, healthy, healthy time where you are going out to the north, to the east, to the west, exploring, riding flying high I mean to say doing whatever you want to do but even then by staying at home in these days uh, you can utilize your learning of uh, you can utilize your e-learning you, you can utilize your learning of drama particularly by turning into a content writer you can give a, you can create awareness about how to how to control how to control covid 19 effect and you can generate a content on that to those students whom i'm teaching well that is your assignment you know i love creative assignments i like something which has a practical significance I like preparing you for the future and for you dears well this is your task you have to prepare an assignment you have to prepare a video a content having dialogues okay well whether it has dialogues or no it is all up to you you have to prepare a creative assignment a creative content the purpose of that content should be to create awareness in journal masses about how to uh, control COVID-19, effects of COVID-19. See? And you can use any, any, any app from Play Store. It is advisable to, to add a literary effect and to add a part where you are also adding your understanding of 18th to 19th century characters and you know incorporate that into your creative content for instance i came across this tiktok the other day in which they had incorporated our today's problem in the style the way our tagral is being performed so that is just a hint that is just an idea that you can that is that is just an idea that how you can incorporate your understanding of 18th and 19th century English trauma with with uh, uh, with generating a content uh, regarding creating awareness about COVID-19 hey you can incorporate the character of Eliza Doolittle, Miss Eliza Doolittle, the flower girl. You can show the transformation. I mean, I'm just giving ideas. It is all up to you. I don't know how you're perceiving, but I would definitely love to check that. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. There are certain references. Check them out. Okay, let us look at uh, what, what is uh, comedy of manners.
A comedy is a play with happy ending and aims at making people laugh at certain follies, vanities, hypocrisies and weaknesses of people for reforming society. Comedies of a comedy of manners is a comedy that deals with the behavior of people. It is a kind of comedy that was a dominant yarn of drama during restoration period. Now the key word when uh, we think about comedy of manners is satire. There is a satire the, there is a satiric tone in such comedies. The use of witty language is meant to highlight the artificial values of the people concerned. According to Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary the comedy of manners is an entertainment form which satirizes the manners and affectations of a social class or of multiple classes often represented by the stereotypical stock characters. From this definition we come to think that what kind of manners or good manners are being satirized. So if just if we will if we look closely Good manners usually refer to the polite, humble, courteous, respectful, and well-cultured social behavior. And usually we find a comedy of manners poking fun at those uh, good manners and unleashing or revealing uh, via satire the hypocrisies of a certain social class or multiple classes. Oscar Wilde's importance of being earnest, it belongs to this category of play and you know it was the, the comedy, of, uh, comedy of menace is well suited to expose the superficial values of the upper class society or middle class society or upper middle class society. The hypocrisies of this class uh, are set rises the hypocrisies of this class are exposed by satirizing the good manners, as I have said earlier. Restoration comedy of manners exposed issues of adultery, fortune hunting, and commercialization of love and marriage, for instance. And even in the later period, when we went to the school for scandal, we find uh, in the character of Mr. Peter and Lady Teasel these issues being exposed and highlighted. The use of wit is very remarkable. We find often that these plays employs not only satire but also wit, pun, a lot of high comedy and low comedy too. I mean amalgamation of high comedy and low comedy. The characters use language that is brilliant on the surface but it, but it is all hollow within. The language usually shows the bankruptcy of emotional and psychological depth. The dialogue is usually short and sharp and such witty language is best suited to depict the artificial values of people. The characters are gallant, fobs, dandies and cookies. A charge of immorality has been brought against such plays. Such plays are neither very realistic but at times they become great work of art. For example, in Importance of Being Earnest, Wilde satirizes the values of then Victorian upper class society or uh, upper middle class society. It doesn't represent the whole cross section of society, it represents a specific class. The same is true for Congreve's Way of the World. Oh, this Yawn comedy of manners refer to English comedies written and performed in the restoration period from 1660 uh, AD to 1710 AD. It is an entertainment form which satirizes the manners and affectations of social class or of multiple classes. 
as I have explained earlier. A manner is a method in which everyday duties are performed. As compared to the tragedy of the Restoration Age, this yandre achieved greater distinction and shame. It was the most characteristic product of the restoration, restoration literature and reflects the spirit of the age more comprehensively than its prose and poetry. Dryden was the first to write comedy of manners with his wild gallant, which was a failure. He wrote several other comedies of manners, which were more successful. Here are a few characteristics of comedy of manner. Number one. It depends upon the dramatic's capacity to present emotional treatment of gender. 2. It is rich with wit and satire and gives the image of the time. 3. The heroine is more important and interesting than the hero in the comedy of manners. For example, Miss Doolittle in The Pygmalion or Hedda Gabler in Hedda. Both hero and heroine are well-dressed, self-possessed, and witty. You know, uh, Pygmalion is a fine example of a hair. Both Mr. Higgins and Miss Doolittle, they are well-dressed. I mean, from Act 3 onward, Miss Doolittle is quite well-dressed, and she grabs the attention uh, whenever she enters on the play. And both characters are self-possessed, both are witty in, uh, in the importance of being earnest. We find the character of Elgernon and uh, what was his name, Jack. They are witty as well. Four. Whereas throughout its long career, English tragedy has always accepted foreign influences, English comedy has been less influenced by them. But restoration comedy of manners took a good deal of continental spirit. So we find uh, Englishness in Pygmalion, in Oscar Wilde's comedies, in Congreve's and Sheridan comedies, and even in Hedda Gabler to a certain extent although it is written by a Norwegian writer. The manners which comedy of manners and, and one thing more, when we come to Hedda Gabler, that is less of a comedy and more of a tragedy. That is a line where comedy is blurring into tragedy. So I am keeping a Hedda in a different quarter because comedy of manners the finer example of comedy of manners include uh, a wild's comedies, the importance of being goodness as you have read, or Pygmalion to a certain extent, Sheridan's comedies, or Congreve's comedies. But when it comes to uh, Hedda Gabler by Henry Gibson, it becomes a less of a comedy and more of a tragedy. The end is pathetic. You cannot call it it is really comic. It's a time when comedy is blurring into tragedy. Also, uh, we see in the comedy of manners that this genre is characterized by realism, social analysis and satire. These comedies held a mirror to the finer society of their age. These comedies are two pictures of I mean to say, the real pictures of that class of, uh, that the, the noble society, the noble class of its age. What uh, Mr. Peter and Lady Teasel are doing on stage, they are in a way, ref in, in School for Scandal, they are reflecting what married, married couples were like in that era, so to speak. Also, along with that, uh, even in the characters of Charles Suffes and Joseph Suffes, we find how, uh, how uh, we find uh, these so called noble offsprings indulging in, uh, in, in activities which are not considered as noble, for example, drinking, gambling, so on and so forth. 
Most comedy writers like the presentations of the scenes and acts of sexual rudeness. The introduction of actresses for the first time on the stage lowered the morality level. These act actresses were mostly women of easy virtue. For instance, uh, Lady Teaser. The writers of the comedy of manners gave much more importance to the wit and polish of their dialogues than to the plot construction, which in views of Aristotle is the soul of a tragedy and a comedy too. So the dialogue is crispy, it is witty, it has punchlines, and it is polished. A way of the World, for instance, by William Congreve is, is a fine example of such kind of comedy in which less attention has been given to the plot of the play but more attention has been given to the witty dialogues. Drama has its own importance and so does has the comedy of manners. There are many comedians, stand-up comedians, including Trevor Noah, Hassan Minaj, Zeti, Superwoman, and so on and so forth, who are working, uh, Shavir, uh, Jaffrey, and, uh, and, and a whole book of youngsters who are doing great job, who are earning as well as learning, uh, along with imparting information and education to a vast number of people and society. The role of uh, comedy or drama cannot be underestimated. There is an example which I am going to present in the next slide where you will come across two contemporary comedians, Ellen DeGeneres and Hassan Minaj, who are discussing about how their names are pronounced, how their names are com uh, uh, mimicked or uh, they are poking fun at the way their names are laughed at, poked fun at, or called at in the universal global village. You can also check out their other content and you will find how splendid these youngsters are. Um, Ellen DeGeneres isn't young, except for her looks. Anyways, uh, these bunch of people are doing great job as an artist um, and they are earning and learning. Off to the example. It's Hi. so nice to meet you. I'm a huge fan. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of you. Thank you. Yeah. And it's Hassan Minaj. No. He, or, yes. No. Really? Well, my name is Hassan Minhaj. Oh. I want to do this, I actually want to do this on, on national television. Good, please, because yeah. everyone that says your name says Hassan Minhaj. Yeah, but the real way you pronounce it, and this is a big deal because my parents are here, it's Hassan Minhaj. And it, people always mispronounce it, they're always like, Hassan Minhaj, Hussein. It, I'm so sorry, I can't pronounce it. Meet my son, Higsby Witherthrottle yeah, III. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> how do you not pronounce Hassan? Try it. All right, Hassan Minish. No, that's not. No. I, look, I appreciate okay. people trying. I was actually, I was doing CNN, which is like, um, it's an it's a international drama show where nine <laughs> people yell at each other. And the host brought me out, and he was like, he was trying really hard. He was like breathing heavily. And he was just like, give it up for Hassan Minhaj. It was like he was casting a spell on me. Yeah. And I'm just like, you don't have to. Say it again so that people hear it again. Hassan Minhaj. Hassan Minhaj. Yes, that's it. Hassan? Yes. Hassan? And look, Hassan? look, when I first kind of you know, started doing comedy, people were like, you should change your name. And I'm like, I'm not going to change my name. If you can pronounce Ansel Elgort, <laughs> you can pronounce Hassan Minhaj. There's an actor just named Ansel Elgort, and we all just walk around pronouncing it uh -huh. completely normally. Yeah. Well, DeGeneres was hard for people to get for a while. What so, did they do? Uh, DeGeneres or Degenerate or like, you know, yeah. lots, of, lots of other things. And you stayed DeGeneres. strong. Yeah, and now it's DeGeneres. Yeah. Um, but Hassan Minhaj. Yeah. Minhaj. Minhaj. Min so the emphasis on the H. I, yes. And what do they do at Starbucks? What well, do they do? At Starbucks, I just go by Timothy Chalamet. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. I just Good. keep it simple. Yeah, and, and they usually do it right with like, they're like, Timothy with two E's? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> wow, girls must freak out when they see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they're kind of disappointed. So, you st you're, so your parents are in the audience. Yeah, mom and dad and are right hi, there. Hi, mom yeah. and dad.
That's Najmi and Seema. Najee and Seema. And they're huge fans of the show, Ellen. Oh, thank you. My mom actually wants me to yeah. change the format of my show, so it's more like Ellen. I see. <laughs> no, I have my show. He can have his, his show is very different than mine, and it's good. Yeah. And that's what I like about it. It's a whole different format. There's a lot more screens, and it's less happy. Yeah. But <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, we cover like really heavy things. You like, do. Yeah. It's really smart. It's a, you have to be super smart to to understand and follow along. Um, but wait, before we get to that, so when did you start in stand up, and how supportive were they? Well, I would actually, Mom, you know this, I would, we had our little secret. I was in college, and I would say, hey, I'm going to the library. And then I would take the Camry, and my, he would, you know, Mom would tell Dad, hey, he's going to the library. And um, so we lived in Davis, and I would drive to the San Francisco Punchline. So it was about an hour. Yeah. And one of these nights when I was going to the library, I ended up crashing the car in Vallejo, which is on the way. And uh, I, I had to call home. And mom, I remember you passed the phone to dad and you're like, I can't, I can't cover for you anymore. <laughs> and so I had my dad <laughs> come to Vallejo and it was rainy, it was super dramatic. And he was like, this is really far for the library, Hassan. <laughs> and I just had this moment where I was like, dad, I'm a stand-up comedian. <laughs> and he was like, why couldn't you be smoking weed like everyone else? <laughs> And that's when I found out that uh -huh. Najmi Minhaj is 420 friendly, so that's cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> but they must, do they go see you a lot? Did they d support you when you started out? No, they didn't support no, me. No. <laughs> Remember, I was going to the library. Yeah, yeah. No. But, but now they do. But now they're cool. Now, as long as I'm doing Ellen, mom was like, I can call in sick. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now you're doing this show, which, and I loved your stand-up special, too. I thought that that was brilliant. But, Thank you. So, so tell everybody what the, the show is, because it is, it's, it's political and funny and a, a great take on everything. Yeah, we'll do, like, we'll do sort of one big comedic investigative report on, say, global warming or, um, you know, student loan debt. Just real fun, interesting <laughs> stuff that people want to watch every right. week. But coming from you, which makes it really uh, easier to uh, digest. Cause yeah. It's, it's still great, but funny, too. Yeah, but yeah. I think people would rather watch, like, a three-year-old come out and try French fries for the first time. Well. Like, the way you guys responded sure. to the French fry thing, oh, I'm like, yeah. we need more of that on the yeah, show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, I say all the time, we're working too hard. We just have to have a kid with a french just, fry. That's yeah. all you really need. Yeah. Um, it's called Patriot Act. It's uh, currently streaming on Netflix. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Andy. Ellen asked me to remind you to subscribe to her channel so you can see more awesome videos, like videos of me getting scared or saying embarrassing things, like ball peen hammer, and also some videos of Ellen and other celebrities, if you're into that sort of thing. Oh, God! Hope you had a great time. Check out the references list. See you someday. Thank you. Fiamanallah.